I've looked at quite a few older systems on this channel, and specifically some older NAS appliances, but when it comes to being old, well, this one takes the cake. This 4-bay system from Acer is by far the oldest NAS I've looked at on this channel. I mean, if the CPU in this thing were a person in the US, it would have a driver's license by now. Regardless of its age, however, this system has some surprising features that just might make it a viable option as an extremely cheap home server or NAS. Doing that, however, probably isn't going to be easy. Now, I'm not going to sugarcoat it. This thing is old, and while working on it, I often found myself waiting for software to install or settings to get applied. I could have spent those few minutes mind-numbingly swiping through YouTube Shorts or scrolling through Facebook, but instead I spent that time learning and improving my problem-solving skills thanks to the sponsor of today's video, Brilliant. Brilliant is an incredible app that lets you learn by doing. It has tons of fun and interactive lessons in math, data analysis, programming, and more. I've found that I love using Brilliant for those little moments throughout the day where you just really don't have anything to do, and rather than wasting time on other apps, I can knock out a few lessons to help me improve critical thinking skills and effectively learn new things. Each lesson is filled with hands-on problem solving that lets you play with new concepts, a method that's proven to be more effective than just watching lecture videos. Recently, I've had a lot of fun with the Exploring Data Visually course, and that's been helpful for me to better understand data, like for example, YouTube Analytics. If you watch my channel, you might be interested in other content like, for example, learning how LLMs work. There you can get hands-on with real-world models and understand things like the importance of good training data. I've really enjoyed building a healthier, more productive habit by using Brilliant, and I imagine you guys will too. If you're interested, you can try everything Brilliant has to offer for free for a full 30 days. Just go to brilliant.org slash hardwarehaven or click the link down in the description. You'll also get 20% off an annual premium subscription, so what are you waiting for? Go get started with Brilliant today. This is the Acer Aspire EasyStore H340, a 4-bay NAS that I believe was released back in 2009. I stumbled across one of these while just perusing Facebook Marketplace, and it piqued my interest, primarily because I noticed what appeared to be a PCIe slot, and also just based on the form factor and layout, I had a sneaking suspicion that there was probably a standard ITX motherboard inside. The Facebook seller lived pretty far away though, but I found the same model on eBay for $60 plus shipping. Obviously on the front it has four 3.5-inch SATA drive bays. There's also some indicator LEDs, as well as the power button, and a USB 2.0 port. On the back there's four more USB 2 ports, a gigabit ethernet port, reset button, and an eSATA port. Like I mentioned earlier, there's also what appears to be a PCIe slot, but we'll have to check on that here in a bit. One thing that isn't on the back is a display output, which will make installing a different operating system a bit more tricky. Speaking of operating systems, this unit would have originally come with an installation of Windows Home Server, an operating system that frankly I didn't know existed until I made this video. Based on this sticker, it seems that the operating system would have been installed on one of these four drives, with the other three reserved for storage. Although it seems like it didn't use RAID, at least not based on a CNET review I pulled up while writing the script. Instead, it would have used Windows Home Server's folder duplication feature, which I also hadn't heard of until making this video. The EasyStore H340 is powered by an Intel Atom Processor 230, and that's not a description, that's the actual model name of the CPU. The Atom Processor 230 is a single-core CPU clocked at just 1.6 GHz, but at least it's a 64-bit chip and supports hyper-threading. The EasyStore I bought came with 2GB of DDR2 memory, as well as a single 1TB drive in the slot marked for the operating system but I didn't know if Windows Home Server was installed or another operating system, or if the system would even work. If the system did have Windows Home Server installed, it seemed that I would need to install the Windows Home Server connector software on my PC to connect to it. But that software doesn't appear to exist anymore, at least not on Microsoft's website. As it so often does, Internet Archive came to the rescue, and after converting the MDF format to an ISO, I was actually able to get it up and running, just in case I needed it. There was still a good chance that there wasn't any operating system installed on this machine, so I wanted to at least find something like a UART header, or more ideally, a PCIe slot to connect a graphics adapter. So I removed three screws on the back of the case, and then slid off the outer cover. This revealed what appeared to be a somewhat standard ITX motherboard with a PCIe slot. I grabbed an old Radeon card that I felt would be compatible with whatever the system might be running, but thanks to this massive dent on the case, it wouldn't fit. Now, I don't want to assume the eBay seller hid this intentionally, but they at least accidentally framed this only picture of the back really well. 
I didn't want to risk damaging components in the system by trying too hard to knock out the dent, at least not while still assembled, so I just used a PCIe extension to do, well, this. Don't judge me. Fortunately, the system posted with no issues, but it seemed like the drive was most likely wiped since the system started trying to just boot over Pixie. I rebooted the system and started spamming F2 to see if I could get into the BIOS, but couldn't. I double checked I was hitting the right key, tried clearing the CMOS, and replaced the very much dead battery in the process, but couldn't get to the BIOS. It would say entering setup and then just start trying to boot over Pixie again. After a few failed attempts, I decided to try and get the motherboard out to see if I was missing something. The front panel easily popped off, and the power supply was just held in with two screws. Other than a few more cables to remove, there wasn't anything else to take apart, but I still couldn't get the motherboard out. I noticed this little panel on the front though, and after removing the screw, I found that I could pull up on a tab and slide the motherboard out. Once outside the case, I hooked up the power supply and the front panel so that I would have a power button. I thought this would make testing easier, but when I tried to turn the system on, well, it wouldn't. It wouldn't even try to post. I double checked all of my connections, double checked that the power supply was working properly, and even thought that maybe this connection to the back plane might be needed for some reason, but still no post. I decided to retrace my steps, so to speak, and reassembled the system back how it was, and it turned on. I still have no idea why, and I don't think I will. I just left the motherboard in the chassis to make sure it worked, and even wired up a little DuPont wire as a makeshift power button to at least keep the front panel off. At least at this point the system would turn on, but I still couldn't get into the BIOS, and at this point I decided to search Google for an answer. I eventually stumbled across this video here, where it showed to jump this little 2-pin header, which I did. I then rebooted to finally find myself in the BIOS, but there really wasn't anything to do here except set the date and check the boot order. Which there, I also now had access to an SMI flash module which contained a recovery partition for Windows Home Server. Now honestly I wasn't really that interested in installing Windows Home Server, but figured this might be one of the only times where it really makes sense to try. Rather than trying to install it onto a spinning disk, I tried adding in a SATA SSD. Now sadly I found that these drive trays don't support 2.5 inch drives, so I just had to set it like this. Once again, don't judge. Unfortunately, I just got errors when trying to install the operating system, so I just decided to move on to installing Debian. Other than the precarious SSD placement, the install process here went really smoothly, although it did take quite some time. I wasn't sure if this was due to the USB 2 ports or the CPU performance, or maybe both. Once the install was finished, I removed the GPU and booted the system headless to find that I could still SSH into it just fine. I was really curious to see just how bad this CPU might be, so the first thing I did was install Sysbench for some quick CPU comparisons. And oh boy. In a single threaded test, it managed just 94 events per second, and when running four threads, just 119. For comparison, the J1900 in this Saturn system from a Marcos Pizza was almost four times as fast in the single threaded test, and over 12 times faster when running the test with four threads and you don't even want to know how much faster a Raspberry Pi 4 is. I wasn't expecting anything incredible from this CPU, but that definitely tempered my expectations. Still, I wanted to give this system a few chances at running something, so I first started by installing Docker, and then Portainer. Once Portainer was working, I tried deploying a stack running just the Home Assistant Docker image from linuxserver.io. I'm not exaggerating much when I say this took ages to deploy. I honestly thought the system had just locked up, but after around 10 minutes, it finally finished deploying, and a bit longer after that, I was able to access the web UI for Home Assistant. I was starting to lose a little bit of hope just with how long it took to deploy, but at least with Home Assistant when doing basic things, it worked just fine. While it would be cool for this thing to function as more of a complete home server for things like Home Assistant alongside storage, it really was designed as just a NAS, so I decided to just focus on that. I wanted to be able to use all four drive bays for storage, so my first thought was to give Unrate a shot, since you run it off of a USB drive. Sadly, no matter what I tried, I could not get the system to boot Unraid. I knew this BIOS wouldn't support EFI, but regardless of how I configured the Unraid media, it just wouldn't work. I was able to confirm that my drive worked on another system, so I'm not really sure. Most likely it's something I was doing wrong, and as I've said many times on this channel, I'm not an expert by any means, so please feel free to give advice down in the comments. So instead of Unraid, I just decided to stick with Debian and just use three 4TB drives for storage. Using MDADM, 
I set up the three drives in a RAID 5 array, which was probably a mistake with this system as I quickly realized the parity rebuild time was going to take quite possibly forever. Maybe that's why this system didn't support RAID in Windows Home Server. I pushed through though and installed Samba and set up a share on the RAID array, but well, performance was not great. This was most likely due to the fact that not only was the system trying to build the initial parity data, but it was also having to calculate the parity data for the current transfers. I decided that maybe just a simple mirror would be better, but I also wanted to have a decent UI. Since Unraid was out of the question at the moment, and there was no way I was going to attempt ZFS with TrueNAS, I decided to install Open Media Vault. I originally just thought to install it on top of my existing Debian install, but that started to become a hassle, so I just installed the operating system from scratch. In theory, I thought having a user interface would be a good thing, but in reality, it was just painful. Now to be fair, Open Media Vault's UI has always been clunky and slow in my opinion, but this was just excruciating. Just applying any setting took at least one to two minutes. Often it was more like five or even ten minutes. I mean, seriously, I realized I misspelled the user Haven and instead wrote Hayen, and I just didn't change it. It was not worth the wait. Now I'm sure some of this was because I had just set up the three drives in a three-way mirror, and it was still building the array while I was getting everything else set up. And to be fair, just that was basically keeping the poor single core atom pegged. But even after waiting over 24 hours for that rebuild to finish, the UI was still painfully slow. For example, just setting up a simple SMB share took a few minutes. In the end though, I did have a functioning NAS. Not good, but functioning. When writing to an SMB share, I was getting speeds a good bit below what could be achieved with a gigabit connection. Now this might have been a limitation of the hard drives, but considering the CPU was basically always pegged during these transfers, my money would be on that. When doing reads, I was actually pretty close to getting gigabit speeds, at least with simple large files. But like I said, this is a usable little NAS that could work as a backup for media or files, but probably not much else. Also, while the 120mm fan was pretty quiet, the 40mm fan in the power supply was not. Also, power draw was, well, also not great. When doing the initial testing where I had a GPU installed, I was seeing system power draw above 50 watts. When running Open Media Vault with the three hard drives and no GPU, I was seeing the system idle at around 40 watts, and then jump up to around 50 watts whenever I was transferring files. The hard drives obviously consumed some of that power, but when doing earlier tests, I never really saw the system drop below 30 watts. So this is by no means a good system to be running in 2024. But at the same time, I have to say it's sort of commendable that Acer designed this in a way that it's still usable in 2024. Not only usable, but possibly upgradable. It uses a mostly standard ITX motherboard, which also has a PCIe slot, and it has a four drive hot swappable backplane that uses just regular SATA cables rather than some custom connector. I'm not going to go as far as to say that you should buy one of these with the intention of upgrading or modifying it with new components, but well, that could be fun. Make sure to get subscribed. Hey, really quick, this is me from the future. I did modify this with a modern motherboard, but it was a bit more of a pain in the butt than I was expecting. I just wanted to be clear on that in this video and not make it seem like it was really easy because, well, it was a bit of a task. If you're curious, make sure and watch the next video. But now, back to, well, this video. As it stands now, though, this Acer NAS just frankly isn't that usable. Still, it was a bit refreshing to see somewhat standard hardware used in a fairly practical way, and I had fun in the process. I hope you did as well, and if you did, maybe consider giving this video a like, maybe consider subscribing, or becoming a raid member for as little as a dollar a month where you get access to some cool perks. That's about it for this one though, so as always, thank you guys so much for watching, stay curious, and I really can't wait to see you in the next one.